Hey, hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great, hanging out in the growth space, doing little weird, random things. Not really weird. I guess it's a little bit weird. I put a laser on the pond. Probably wasn't necessary, but it's fun to look at. I know, the lighting situation's very odd. Playing around with some things. The grow lights are so bright that they cancel out my filming lights, so everything behind everything I do wants to focus. Not ideal, but working with it, playing around. I have some new lights coming that I can put overhead. Anyways, I've got some fun new plants in the mail. These are all heliconias. I had mentioned when I did my heliconia video way back, I don't know, a few months ago, I guess it's not that long ago, that when I got around to winter potting with these, then I would talk about that. So here we are. No, it's heliconias that I have here on the table. What I'm doing here will really apply to a lot of plants, like the heliconias, gingers, bananas, those sorts of plants. Pretty much anything that's going to show up in the mail with a single growth and a rhizome underneath it. I have a variety of different heliconias here. I have two of these Petra heliconias. These are all Ceterocorums here, parrot speak type heliconias. The Petras, I believe two to four feet high, somewhere in there, two to three feet is probably more typical. They're basically an Andromeda, but the flowers are supposed to be larger and more robust. The Andromeda has a really pretty orange and red inflorescence on it. But I have one of these cotton candies here. The cotton candy has a pink, a very light blush pink inflorescence on it that I think will look nice. And then I have two of the flamingos. These I'm excited about. I'm excited about all of them, but the flamingos have a really pretty flower on them. It's kind of like a magenta-y color on the inflorescence and then the bracts that are on the inside are kind of a lime green, yellowy sort of color. They kind of have like a 80s neon thing going for them. That's why I really like those. Lots of bright colors. So for starters, when I get something like this in the mail, the first thing to do, open it up, right? <laughs> open it up and save the tags. Gotta check out those rhizomes, see what's going on. Some people will ship them wrapped in moss. Some people will ship them wrapped in newspaper. Sometimes they aren't shipped in anything at all. These are all wrapped in damp newspaper, which is great. That's what I like to see. If you are wondering, these are from Ye Brahms on Etsy. I think they're on eBay too. They have great heliconias. They always show up nice and healthy. This is small, but not really all that atypical from what would normally come in the mail. This rhizome part down here is very immature, but it does have a lead coming off of there where it's going to have some new growth. That's probably what the rest of these are going to look like, but we'll go ahead and open them up and get a better look. I have to say, I am very pleased with how these are looking. It's pretty cold here right now, so shipping was a risk, but they were packaged well and they shipped quickly. Full disclosure, the way I do things with actively growing tropical rhizomes that have been shipped in the winter time my method isn't necessarily conventional. There are just some things I've noticed over the years that make it easier to get them up and going. So th there are lots of different ways to do these things. Comment down below. What do you like to do with your heliconias and gingers? Just the roots you get in the mail, things that can't go dormant. You got to get them growing right away. The first thing I like to do is after inspecting them, making sure that there aren't any soft spots. Don't want to see any mush or anything like that. If I do encounter a soft spot or some mush, then I cut that out of the plant. Then I'll either go into where I made that cut and apply some cinnamon powder, sometimes sulfur powder. I prefer cinnamon though, or just cinnamon, it would be cinnamon powder, you know, ground cinnamon. That will help dry that spot up and give it a couple of days and then I will get it potted up. These all look really good. Luckily that's not something I've had to deal with too many times, but still, since these are plants that like things warm, moist, lots of humidity, and when you're indoors, those are all like just the recipe for rot, right? So just to be safe, this might be overkill. You don't necessarily have to do this part. I like to either give them a really good rinse before I pop them up, or I will give them a little spray with some peroxide. Let that sit on there for, I don't know, 30 seconds, if even, and then give it a rinse. I'm gonna go ahead and give them all that spray, tops and bottoms all the way around. That's going to help kill off any bacteria, funguses, mold spores, anything of the sorts that might be harboring right around those roots where you know, we want things to be nice and clean for the start. Poor things don't have much of a defense going right now, right? They've just been dug up and cut and shipped and everything. So I just figure better safe than sorry. Give them a quick rinse and that's it. Simple and easy. All right, so everything's all clean and sanitized. The one thing I didn't mention that I really should have was that if these aren't wrapped in like a damp moss or in damp newspaper, 
I usually like to go ahead and put them in a bowl of just fairly lukewarm water. I say that because saying room temperature is kind of obscure because everybody's houses are a different temperature. Just barely lukewarm, let them soak for a few hours, and then move on to what I've been doing here. Little spritz, little rinse, or even just a rinse, that's probably enough. I've already pre-filled these pots with a little bit of soil. They're, I don't know, maybe a third of the way full. I'm using a blend that has some organics in it, but it's not absolutely overloaded. This is actually just Espoma potting mix. I've had really great luck with it with my Heliconias, Gingers, Bananas. Holds on to moisture for a bit, how they prefer, but it still drains well, it's nice and airy. There's a good amount of organic materials in it, but not so much that I'm gonna have to worry about the plant rotting right off the bat. The way I grow Heliconias inside is absolutely nothing like how I grow them outside. Heliconias, Gingers, Bananas, all the plants we've been talking about, they really like things organically rich. So outside, manure, compost, like I throw, I'll throw it all at the plants. Inside, no. Having some in there is a good idea. They will appreciate it, but they don't need a ton. The focus right now, while they're inside, is just getting the roots established and getting this rhizome up and going. So that then takes it back to why there's not very much soil in this pot, why I only start off with just a little bit of soil in the bottom. Heliconias, gingers, bananas, calatheas, root of paradise. That's not a plant you would order as a root or a rhizome. Really, it's not really with most calatheas either. Still, you get the point. These are plants that like to fill out their container before they take off and start moving. Generally, once they put out their roots and they start to feel something on the side, that's when the growth will go boom and they'll explode in growth. If you've ever noticed that perhaps a bird of paradise is a good example, especially nowadays because they're shipping out much smaller but still in the same size container. So you get a white bird of paradise, maybe a couple feet tall in a 10 inch container. And oftentimes they'll just sit there for a few months and not do much, maybe put out a leaf here and there, but not much is happening. Not much that we can see anyways, but there's a lot going on down here. Once the roots of the plant hit the side of the pot, then all of a sudden, boom, they take off. That's, that's what's going on over here. That's about as high as I go with the soil until I start to see some growth on the plant. You want to make sure that the whitish part, so on this rhizome right here, where there's tons of glare, this one right around here, that would be the depth we would want this. We'd want the soil to make sure to be covering that part. That's about where it was covering it when it was removed. Very, very shallow plants, right? Those rhizomes stay fairly close to the surface of the soil. I also really like having this extra large lip here because these are plants that really, really, really like their water. So when I go to water them, I can give them a heavy drink and not have soil and everything splashing out the top. Where if this were potted to just right around that ridge, you have to give it a drink and wait for it to soak down, give it a drink, wait for it to soak down. This way I can give them a big drink and just move on with things speed things up. The way this differs from how I would do this during summer when I have these outside and things are nice and toasty, it's different inside because, well, one, I'm keeping them in a much smaller container. I still start them out fairly small during the summertime because, like I said, it's all about getting those roots going. These are plants that tend to like to be stepped up slowly. So with heliconias, I'll start them in these four inch and six inch containers. And then once I start to see uh, probably two to three new growths come out from the pot and it feels nice and firm, and there, then I would just bump it up one pot size and then another. I do it very slowly indoors. Outdoors, I will make a larger jump because it's just, it's so much warmer out there. It's just the benefit to having that heat and humidity if you live someplace with warm, humid summers, they will fill out those containers fairly quickly. So it's like something like this, I would easily bump it up to a 10 inch container when it's outside. I don't think I showed y'all this one. Doesn't this look nice? Got a new growth coming out from below, has a two side shoots right here. I never expect much from these shoots. That's another important thing to mention. By the shoots, I mean the big growths that are right there. That's more like a handle more than anything. There's energy in there that can go back down there into that rhizome to help get it going. Generally, it's best to fully expect those growths that are up there, these pieces right there, expect that to die. Those pieces aren't there for the long haul, just to help get things going. That's it. Not much is gonna happen from these parts. That does somewhat depend on the size of the rhizome too. So if these have larger rhizomes on them, then maybe that main growth might go ahead and do something. I wouldn't expect it to. I don't know if any of these are peeking out. Mm, yes, kind of. Yeah, this one right here. Here. See the top of that, how there's a little nub sticking out? These all grow monopodally, so a single growth all rises from the center part right here. 
there is potential for that to keep going, but I wouldn't count on it. It's extremely unlikely. But ones like this, where they have these growths coming up, that slender point, those are new growths. So potentially something will happen with those, but again, it's not something I really count on. If that growth were to take off and grow, fantastic. It really is just going to depend on the plant, how much rhizome is down there. If there's a nice, big, healthy rhizome down there, then that's going to have more energy stored up to continue growing up above the soil as well as down below the soil. And then of course, a very nice, heavy drink. I'm, I'm going to do that off camera. I really don't need water all over the table right now, but a nice drink to make sure that that water flushes through, that that soil is consistently moist all the way through. Don't want it to dry out for very long at all, since these rhizomes are just getting going and just starting to try and get back to life. And then the last thing I like to do, just because I've been mentioning warm, moist, organically rich soil, just gonna go ahead and try and just stay ahead of the game there when it comes to fungus gnats, just to be safe. Is the conditions that these plants prefer are also the conditions that are very favorable to fungus gnats. The spikes on these tags really suck. They don't go in very well. I don't have many fungus gnats out here, but I've seen some. It's like with the peroxide, with giving a little rinse, just easier to be proactive than reactive. Help keep any outbreaks to an absolute minimum. Hopefully just not have them at all. That would be ideal. I'm out here in my grow space. It's pretty toasty. That's where I'm more than likely going to keep these to get going. Heliconias, gingers, all those plants I mentioned, they like it warm. It varies in here. I'm still kind of learning the new heater, but it varies between 77 and like 84. And then at night, I let the temperature fall to about 72, sometimes 68. With these heliconias being in here now, I'm not going to let it drop to 68 anymore. I think 72 is going to be my cutoff for that. Humidity falls to a minimum of about 50%. I've actually been trying to keep the humidity down, which is a big change from how things have been in the past. Said it over and over again, heliconias. They like things warm, they like things humid. So if you're starting these indoors, you you know don't have an 80 degree garage with a pond in it to start your plants off in, you know, if you're a normal human, then it may not be a bad idea to put a stick in here and then put a plastic bag over the top to help hold in some moisture so that they don't dry out too terribly quickly. If you do that, make sure they're not in direct sun, like direct through a window because they can get really hot inside of those bags. They like it hot, but not magnified intense heat, right? That'll just cook them. They all are going to need light, but until they actually start putting up leaves, I'm more focused on making sure that those roots are going to get going. And light is still part of that. There's chlorophyll inside of those stems. The kind of light you give them is just going to depend on what kind you're growing. You have to look that up. I wish I could be more direct and give a flat out answer, but with heliconias, there are kinds that like all different light. Same with the gingers and all the other plants I've been talking about. Some of them like lots and lots of sun. Some of them are going to prefer more shade. The only thing I will say is that it's good to be aware of what kind of light they're getting in relation to their watering since they don't have a root system on them yet. It's, you know, it's just a little chunk of rhizome. So we don't want there to be so much light that the plant can't keep itself hydrated, right? Just keep a watchful eye. In general, they should be fairly easy to keep going so long as things aren't too cool and too wet because as we start to run into issues with the rot. Okay, and then what about once they get going? Inside, up a pot size, that's it. And outdoors, like I would I would easily take something like this and put it in a 10 inch container and just be very patient. Wait a couple months, it'll fill it out, get going, it'll be totally fine. With what I have right here, I'm hopeful that I would think in the next six to eight weeks, somewhere in there, maybe six to 10 weeks, but closer to six weeks, then uh, there should be at least two new growths coming out of each one of these containers and hopefully they will feel firm down below. And that's when I know, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and bump them up a pot size. So the four inch pots will go up to a six inch pot because that's the next common size. You don't see many five inch pots around. And the six inch pot will go up to an eight inch pot because that's the next pot size for that plant. And when I do so, I'm not going to be as particular about making sure that I'm using a potting mix that isn't overly saturated with organics. In fact, once those plants are established into their container, that's when you start throwing all kinds of organics at them. Compost, rock dust, manure, whatever pleases you, they will appreciate it. Heliconias love it. They love all kinds of organics in their soil. It still needs to drain well, but it needs to stay moist. And then don't be discouraged if you give it a shot and it doesn't work out. Because here's the thing, heliconias, they make horrible houseplants. These things suck to try and keep alive during the winter time. Even in a warmer growth space like this, they still throw a fit. They really are plants that in general 
just prefer to be outside. I've been growing these for many years and just what I've found with getting them started, if you're starting them inside, because we want blooms on them by summer, right? So if you can only get them as these little chunks of rhizome, you want to get a head start. So keep the soil shallow so that not too much water is going to hold up in there, even though they like things moist. Still need to avoid rot because they don't have roots to pull up that water yet, right? Once they get going, bump them up and start hitting them with the organics, with the fertilizer. Same thing when I see two growths on each one, then I'll start to go into more fertilizing. I'll use an all-purpose liquid fertilizer. The compost teas, they really do like those a lot as well. There's blood meal, oh, seaweed fertilizer. I've always had great luck with that. They like the seaweed fertilizers. It's stinky, it's not the most ideal thing to use indoors, but maybe once you get them moved out for summer, you can use the more stinky things on them. <laughs> Same thing with manure, right? I don't use much manure on my house plants because it stinks and it really, it just attracts the critters. Number one killer of heliconias inside and probably gingers, calatheas, a lot of those plants is rot. Well, it can be underwatering, especially with calatheas, not having enough humidity and enough water for them and rot. Another reason I like to keep the organics not out of the mix because they need it, but I'm not overloading it like I would during the summertime. I have a separate video talking about how I grow them outdoors in containers and in the ground. I don't live where they can stay out all year, but overall general care for a huge family of plants. It's pretty generalized because they have different preferences depending on what kind you're growing. But this is just about getting them going. Hopefully this was helpful. Everyone has their own methods and ways that they like to do things. This is just what I found works best for me to avoid rot and to get them to start taking off the fastest. I had pretty good success with it so far, as long as they don't ever end up cold and wet. That's when things become a problem. I talk about warm, loving plants a lot with houseplants, right? There's some plants that just like a nice, warm, humid space. If you say warm for a heliconia, it's kind of like with a coconut palm. It doesn't mean 72, 74, like just kind of warm indoor temperatures. I think average household temperature is like 68 to 72, but I know people who keep their house in the 80s and people who keep it in the 50s. Those temperatures can be all over the place. I think when you Google it, the average is that range, 68, 72. 72 is not warm for a heliconia. 74, not really warm. 77, you're getting there. Really, 80 to 82 is where I usually see the most activity out of them. It's important for them to have that warmth who want to keep them in active growth because that active growth helps keep all of their systems in check, which helps avoid things like rot and helps to ward off pests too, right? The healthier the plant, then the least you have to worry about pests. All right, comment down below, tips, tricks, suggestions, always appreciated. We all have lots of different methods. This is just what I've been doing for the last several years and what's worked the best for me. And just say hi, I love talking to everybody. Hope you're doing well. Before I forget, I'm gonna go ahead and move these over to my plant racks and give them a water. Give them a water, a watering. Watering, that's what I meant to say. And we'll go ahead and make sure that these all get a very nice, heavy drink. Settle the soil, get any bubbles out of there, help get those roots going. Keep everybody updated in the vlogs with what happens with these. Just have to give it some time and see. Hopefully they'll take off. And if they aren't doing much out here, then I'll go and move them and put them under my fish tank. I did that with some others right above the water, but the filters underneath the tank and it has grow lights on it for some plants that grow in the filter and that water's nice and warm and humid and those did really well. But it's actually warmer out here than it is in that tank, so. They should be okay. Grow lights are on, I believe, 13 hours a day. I can't remember, you know, it's on a timer. You set it once and you totally forget, but I think it's 12 or 13 hours and that should be ample for them. Anyways, thanks for hanging out. Had a good time getting those heliconias potted up. One of my favorite plants, so I'm really looking forward to see what comes of those over the next several weeks and I'm um, looking forward to reading your comments, see what kinds of tips and tricks people have. All right, everybody, as always, and most importantly, keep on growing. Bye-bye.